Hi folks. You know, you can have the most sophisticated scientific technology, the best analysts in the world, or unlimited resources, but none of that will matter unless you have good evidence to work with in the first place. So where does good evidence come from? It comes from proper processing of the crime scene. So today, we're going to be looking at the crime scene, how to process it, how to collect evidence. Let's begin. Our first question is, what is the crime scene? How do we define the crime scene in the first place? Okay, so the crime scene includes the following. First of all, the specific place where the crime occurred. Second of all, all paths of entry or exit. And third, any nearby areas where evidence may have been discarded or moved. Let's look at some examples. What would we call the crime scene for a murder committed in the ballroom of a hotel? Well, the ballroom is the place where the crime occurred, so that would certainly be part of the crime scene. Hallways adjacent to entering into or providing exits from the ballroom would also be part of the crime scene. Perhaps uh, stairwells, elevators, ways of accessing the floor where the ballroom was. Uh, we'd also include hotel dumpsters, garbage chutes, things of that nature where evidence might be disposed of. What about a bank robbery? Well, certainly the bank itself, but perhaps also the alley behind the bank or some of the adjacent streets. Here's a crime scene where a homicide occurred, and uh, you can see that the, uh, there's a great deal of blood at the scene, and uh, a number of items of interest have been marked out with these yellow flags. So, you're a first responder, you're arriving at a crime scene, maybe you're a police officer, maybe you're emergency medical staff, uh, you're somebody who's arrived to a crime scene first. What are the obligations of a first responder at a crime scene? First of all, call for backup. Uh, if you were to investigate a crime scene yourself and became incapacitated in some way, then it would be too late to call for backup and it would take quite some time for somebody to find you and re render assistance to you uh, and, and uh, help anybody at the crime scene who needed attention. So what does backup involve? It might mean additional police forces, it might mean emergency medical uh, services, so an ambulance, it might mean fire, whatever is appropriate given the nature of the crime. If it's arson, you call fire, for example. If there are people hurt, you get emergency medical attention. In most cases, police will be useful as well. Uh, if there are people who need medical care, then you provide whatever you are capable of providing until uh, folks with greater proficiency arrive. You also need to secure the scene. Uh, this means putting up barriers, making sure nobody enters or exits the scene. So you're going to establish a perimeter, decide on the spot what is the crime scene, what parts of this area need to be secured, where do you draw the line, in other words, that's establishing the perimeter. Uh, you establish the perimeter physically with ropes, barricades, crime scene tape, and guards. So not only do you want to visually distinguish the crime scene, so passers-by know that they cannot enter, but you also want to put things in their way so that they cannot enter. So these could be physical barricades, and often these are guards, so police officers or detectives who can stand there and say, uh, you know, move along, uh, this is a closed crime scene. Part of the purpose of securing the scene is to prevent people from leaving the crime scene. If, again, there were a murder in a, in a hotel ballroom, you might have a large number of people who would like very much to leave this place, but who may be connected with the crime. And so you need to uh, acquire the details of those people, interview them at the scene, or at least have a means of following up with them later. These people may be suspects in the crime, they may also be witnesses. So they may have seen what happened, and if you let them go, you may never find them again, and you may lose the information that they have as witnesses forever. We also want to make sure that people don't enter the crime scene. So people entering the crime scene might destroy the evidence, either intentionally or unintentionally. So a person might return to a crime scene knowing that there's some really damning piece of evidence there and destroy it. Uh, or a person might just wander through the crime scene and destroy important evidence by trampling all over it totally accidentally. Who do we want to prevent? Random passers-by, um, neighbors, family, and even emergency personnel that are not authorized to be there. So if you have a, a, you know, some police officers that are not necessary for the investigation that are posting on the perimeter, those people should stay on the perimeter. Uh, we want as few people as possible going to the crime scene to prevent destruction of the evidence. So uh, once we've secured the scene and we have the proper people on site, it's time to search the crime scene. But before that, we have to do a, a couple important processes to preserve the crime scene. Uh, first of all, we need to record it. So this is before we search, before we collect evidence, we have to record the crime scene one way or another. 
how do we do this? We can do it with detailed notes. So you can just write down notes on a notepad. You can record them with an audio recorder. We can do rough sketches of the crime scene to try to represent what we've seen. We can also take pictures, and this is a really common technique. Uh, photographs are very faithful and uh, are unlikely to miss something that a sketch might miss. When we do photography, we want to take a series of shots. So we want to take uh, establishing shots. So in the ballroom, this might be a, a shot actually of the hotel from the outside. Um, then we want to take long range shots, medium and close up. So we want to kind of move toward the location of the crime. I'll show you some crime scene photography in just a moment. Uh, video is also a way that crime scenes can be recorded. A person can walk through the scene with the video camera. They can record. They can also give their recorded notes over the video and uh, get yet two types of information recorded at once. That's also very common. Here's an example of a crime scene sketch for a homicide. So what you can see here is it's, it's a really basic sketch of the room where the crime was committed. You can see some dimensions on the outside. Um, it's a relatively rough sketch. So this is the sort of sketch which would be done at the crime scene and then would later be cleaned up once all the information had been collected. So let me walk you through this. So you can see here there are some items of furniture. Here's a bookcase, fireplace, there's a chair, a couch, a table, and so forth. Um, then you'll also see that there are a number of these little um, arrow things. Uh, what these are are the positions from which photos were taken. So any time the crime scene photographer took a picture of the crime scene, the sketch artist, who may have been the same person, draws a little triangle to indicate where that photo was taken from. Now this will help later on to orient whoever's looking at these pictures to the crime scene in general. So that's an important part of crime scene photography. We have items of particular interest highlighted with letters circled. So there's a blood stain, a blood stain, a blood stain, a blood stain. Here's the victim's body. Uh, there were shell casings found, bullet shell casings found in different locations. Here's the phone, uh, tipped over wine glass, and so forth. So from a, a sketch like this, we may even be able to reconstruct what happened. Okay, so speaking of crime scene photography, here is a close-up from a crime scene. Here you can see a cartridge shell casing uh, in the carpet. You can see that a ruler has been added to provide scale. Close-ups are notoriously bad for scale. It's really difficult to tell how big something is when you don't have other objects surrounding it for context. Easy way to solve that, put a ruler in the frame, then there's no ambiguity at all how big the thing is. If we zoom out a bit, so this was a close-up, if we zoom out a bit, we can see a medium shot. You can see the orange cone there is to direct anybody's attention to that cartridge casing. Uh, you can see, if you just look at the image, the cartridge casing is difficult to see, but the orange cone makes it unmissable. If we zoom out a little bit further, then we've got a shot of the crime scene. You can actually see the victim on the bed there in the background. So we'd want to take probably some additional shots of, this looks like a, a house or an apartment, uh, of the, the house, the area around it, and so forth. So now I'd like to show you an example of crime scene videography. This is from a film called Into the Abyss. We're actually going to be watching it in our class. It's a terrific documentary. If you are a passerby on the internet and you're watching this series of lessons, I highly recommend Into the Abyss. It's on Netflix. All right, so let's take a look. This is some crime scene videography from a triple homicide that was investigated uh, in Texas. Let's take a look.
they went back up to the door and the garage was open and the door going into the house was open. Uh, Michael Perry, by his own admission, entered that garage door and went into the laundry room at the time that Jason Burkett knocked on the front door. And as their truck was out here, it told them that the truck wouldn't start and they needed to call someone to come uh, and assist them. So she let him in the house to use the telephone and while he was doing that, Michael Perry stepped out of the laundry room and knocked on the back garage door, which made her come and answer it and he stepped out from the laundry room from behind her and that's when he shot her. All right, so there you saw some examples of crime scene videography. It's an effective way to record the crime scene. Once we've done all the recording and we've preserved the scene as it was when we found it, now it's time to search the crime scene. Now, the reason we need to do all that stuff ahead of time is because the searching process is inherently destructive. We're going to be moving through the space, we're going to be collecting objects. When we're done with the search, the crime scene will not be the same as it was when we arrived. So it's really important that we record the crime scene as it was when we got there before we go about changing the crime scene. All right, so general principles here. The goal of searching a crime scene is to find all relevant physical evidence. When we find it, we should mark it and photograph it before we collect it. Again, once you collect it, there's no going back and saying, oh, well, I, I think it was over here. No, put a flag down, put a cone down, take a picture, then you can collect it. We want to collect anything that could be evidence and anything that might be a carrier of evidence. So, for example, we might have a wool sweater at the scene, uh, which could be uh, a source of fibers that might be useful for the investigation. You could maybe get a sense right now that there's going to be a tension between trying to collect as much possible evidence as you can and also not wanting to collect every object at the crime scene. Um, if you had unlimited resources and time, of course that would be the ideal, but uh, law enforcement offices are always dealing with multiple crimes. They have limited resources, limited time, limited personnel, and so they have to prioritize what they feel is most likely to be useful evidence. How do they know that? It just comes from experience. An important principle of crime scene searching is that the crime scene is to be disturbed as little as possible. So investigators are forbidden from eating, drinking, smoking, opening or shutting windows, tampering with the heat or the air conditioning. We want to try to keep everything just the way it is. We also want to make sure to collect what are called standard reference samples. So if we collect, for example, a, a piece of carpet from that, that, that appears to have a blood stain on it, we would also want to collect a piece of carpet that does not appear to have any blood stain on it. So that when we take this blood stained carpet back to the lab and do some tests to see whether it is really blood, we want to have essentially a control group to perform those same tests on. Uh, imagine, for example, if we took a, a square of carpet that appeared to have a blood stain, a square of carpet that uh, did not appear to have a blood stain, imagine we do the test to establish whether, whether indeed it is blood and the blood stain. It turns out it is blood, or so the test says, but then we do the test on the unstained piece of carpet and it also turns up positive. Well, this would suggest that actually there's something in the carpet that triggers a positive result on this test. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen. We want to see a positive result on the blood stain and a negative result on the carpet. That's what's required for us to say, oh yeah, according to the results of this test, this really is blood. So standard reference sample basically provides a baseline comparison. It's like the control group for any good scientific experiment. And finally, when we're actually carrying out the search, we want to lower the risk that we add stuff to the crime scene by wearing coveralls, a face mask, gloves, and eye protection. And that not only protects the crime scene from us, it also protects us from the crime scene. There may be blood at a scene, but blood may come from people who have infectious diseases, for example. Um, there may be sharp objects that could stick us or cut us. We want to protect the crime scene. We also want to protect ourselves. So here's an image of a person who is, who is really decked out for a crime scene uh, evidence search. What types of evidence can we find at the crime scene? Clothing may be important evidence, carpeting or upholstery samples, fingernail scrapings underneath the fingernails of the victim, for example, vacuum sweepings, meaning we vacuum the scene, then we take the canister out, and we, uh, whatever we found in the vacuum, uh, that's what we take with us. Uh, weapons, of course, bodily fluid stains, blood, tissue, and organs from bodies. Now, this is something that we wouldn't do on the scene, but if the body were removed, 
to a uh, medical examiner's office, then the collection of tissue samples, blood samples, um, organ sections, photographs of the body, any wounds, uh, things like that would be really, really quite important. Once we've identified evidence and we wish to collect it, what do we, how do we actually go about doing that? What's the process for actually picking up evidence and taking it with us? Our overriding goal when we're collecting evidence is to prevent changing the evidence in any way. We want to keep that evidence in good shape and we don't want anything, um, we don't want to lose any information by mishandling it. What are the threats? Uh, we could contaminate the evidence, we could break it. If the evidence in question is something that can evaporate, then it could just evaporate and disappear. Uh, we could scratch it, bend it. Uh, there are a lot of possible ways to, to destroy the evidence that, that might be vital to our case. To prevent contamination, we're always going to use latex gloves or disposable forceps to touch the evidence. We're never going to use our bare hands. And we're always going to try to change the gloves or the forceps. If it's not possible, we can clean them when handling different pieces of evidence. So we don't want to pick up a bloody knife with a glove, package it up, and then go and, and you know pick up a t-shirt with that same bloody glove. Now we've transferred blood from the knife to the glove. So we have to, or from the knife to the, the shirt. Uh, we don't want to change the evidence, again, by moving things around, contaminating the evidence. Uh, Usually, also, we don't want to try to remove trace evidence. Trace evidence is like really small evidence, like hairs or fibers from an object. If we can, we want to package them together. Uh, the way that the trace evidence is on the object might be important. That said, if the hair or fiber seems like it's going to fall off then, and, and you're going to lose it, then you want to preserve it. All right. So how do we package it? For all evidence, we want to package each item separately. So nothing goes in the same bag with another piece of evidence. That's a recipe for contamination. We want to label the package clearly. You want to say, who are you? When did you collect it? What is it? And uh, you know what crime is this associated with? And so on, so that the evidence doesn't get lost. Uh, we want to seal the evidence with a tamper-evident closure. So this is a closure that if somebody were to try to open the bag, it would be obvious that they had done so. If we don't do this, then somebody in a, in a court of law might uh, question us, you know, say we have an, an airtight case, it's really, really obvious that person A committed this crime. Uh, their lawyers can and should ask the question, how do we know this evidence wasn't tampered with while it was in your evidence locker? we should be able to come back and say, well, we sealed everything with these tamper-evident closures. If that had happened, you'd be able to see it. Otherwise, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to say, it's possible the evidence was tampered with, this evidence should be rejected by the jury. So we want to take good care of our evidence. If evidence is biological in nature, meaning it's, it's um, some bodily fluid or tissue or something like that, we have to treat it specially. So we want to only use sterile, disposable tools for handling it. We don't want to introduce any fungus or bacteria or anything that would decompose the sample. Ideally, we should air dry it on the scene. That'll prevent decomposition of the sample as well. Then we want to package it in a porous container, such as a paper envelope or a paper bag. This will allow air flow in but not uh, bacteria or, or mold spores or other things like that. That'll help keep it from decomposing. Use a plastic bag, it gets moist, it decomposes, you lose the evidence. Right. Uh, we also want to, for the safety of ourselves and other investigators who might come into contact with the evidence, we want to stick a little biohazard sticker on that so that folks know this came from a person, it could be infectious and should be handled with care. For arson evidence, uh, we want to follow a slightly different procedure. Instead of a porous container, we want a non-porous container that is airtight. Uh, a lot of the accelerants that are used to facilitate the burning of a room, a building, a car, uh, are very volatile, meaning they evaporate quickly. And so if we don't seal in those fluids, then we could very easily lose all of them by the time we get around to processing the evidence. So we want to seal it in an airtight container to prevent the loss of whatever chemicals might be present. Here are some photographs of examples of evidence packaging materials. Here's a tamper-proof uh, plastic envelope that's containing, in this case, some um, cartridge casings, looks like from rifle rounds. Uh, here is the packaging of a pistol. And here is a porous 
paper bag that you might use for uh, some biological evidence. Some further examples, here's a, a bag that has clearly been used to contain biological evidence. You can see the biohazard sticker right there at the bottom and the security uh, seal. Here is a container which is sold by a company called Searchy for containing arson evidence. If it looks a lot like a paint can, that's because basically it, it is a paint can. Paint cans are, are designed in such a way that they, they prevent evaporative loss of, of the paint. And uh, so that's exactly what we want. So a lot of the arson containers really just look like paint cans because that's basically what they are. So now you might wish to ask yourself how you would handle and package each of the following pieces of evidence. How would you handle and package a wall-to-wall -wall carpet with a one-foot diameter bloodstain? How would you handle and package a white cotton t-shirt with dark hairs on it? Or a fuming noxious rag from an arson scene? What about a revolver? What about a glass with lipstick on the rim? Take a moment, pause the video, and just say out loud or jot down some notes. How would you handle and package these objects? And then we'll talk about it. Ready, go. Okay, we're back. So a wall-to-wall -wall carpet with a one-foot diameter blood stain. Well, you can't really take the whole carpet with you, but you could cut out a section of that, package it in a porous envelope, seal it up with tamper-evident tape, and then uh, put a biohazard sticker on it. For a white cotton t-shirt with dark hairs on it, we would try, if we can, not to remove the hairs from the t-shirt. Uh, we could package that up in either a porous or a, preferably a porous container, but a non-porous one might be okay as well. Uh, if we have a noxious fuming rag from an arson scene, we'd want it to be in an airtight container. A revolver ought to be picked up very carefully, since we don't know if there are still live rounds in it, and secured in, uh, as you saw before, with uh, zip ties perhaps, in a uh, cardboard container. And glass with lipstick on the rim. Uh, I think, again, because this is potentially a biological sample, porous container marked with... Uh, sealed with tamper-evident tape would be preferable. So, here, here's a question. We've talked about how to properly handle evidence, how to carefully collect it, and so forth, but people make mistakes. So if we make mistakes, how can we as forensic scientists make up for evidence that has been mishandled, or contaminated, or evidence that just was never collected in the first place? What can we do to fix that error once it's been committed? How can we recover from it? We can't. If evidence is destroyed, contaminated, or left behind, there's nothing you can do. So if this is vital evidence to the case, you've lost your case. You may now be uh, looking at a case where uh, somebody who committed a horrible crime can go free, or you may be now looking at a situation where a jury feels more comfortable sentencing an innocent person to jail for something they didn't do. So it's extremely important that we do the best we possibly can to take care of the crime scene, secure the scene, process the evidence with the utmost care and attention, photograph everything ahead of time, and, and really do the best we can because these cases are going to turn on how well we collected the evidence. So what happens if a crime scene evidence is mishandled or contaminated? Here are some of the consequences. Investigations in the laboratory will fail if the evidence is damaged or contaminated. Uh, the judge might throw it out completely and say this isn't worthy of being brought into the trial. Uh, the opposing attorney may, may call it out as, as being unacceptable, and they would be right to do so. It may be that you have insufficient evidence, guilty people go free, they could possibly kill again, or innocent people get punished, and in a country with a death penalty like the United States, uh, they may even be killed for something they didn't do. So clearly these are really serious consequences that we would like to avoid uh, as much as possible. I'd like to tell you about the case of Jean Benet Ramsey, uh, which is a, a fairly famous one, but you know it's, it's worth looking at. A lot of folks know about this case, but don't know the details. So in the case of Jean Benet Ramsey, uh, so this little girl on the right is, is Jean Benet Ramsey. Uh, her parents, Patsy and John Ramsey, found a ransom note in their home, and it said, we've kidnapped your daughter, and we're demanding $118,000, which is sort of a peculiar number. Uh, the police then began an investigation of the crime scene, which was the Ramsey home from which it was suspected she was kidnapped. Uh, however, they did not establish a perimeter. Five friends of the Ramseys were able to enter the house and move about at will with no police escort all around the house. In the initial crime scene investigation, 
uh, John, the father, was allowed to just leave the crime scene unattended by police for two hours. He could have been doing anything in that time. Um, family members of victims are prime suspects whenever there's a disappearance or a murder. Um, so this was really a, 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 a big mistake. Um, John, the father, and two of his friends were permitted themselves to conduct the search rather than professional crime scene investigators and, 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 and evidence collection technicians. This is really awfully strange. Um, John, her father, not a crime scene investigator or an evidence processing technician, was the one that actually found John Bonet's body. He then picked her up from where he found her, carried her upstairs, and took a white blanket from her and set it aside. No photographs were taken of where she was found. Uh, there was no processing by professionals of the crime scene. Uh, this was a man who should have been considered as a prime suspect in the murder, who was allowed to manipulate evidence, move the body, and uh, proceed as though he were a part of the investigation instead of a suspect in it. The result, there was no conviction ever achieved for John Benet's murder. And it turned out later there was a lot of evidence to suggest that perhaps the parents were involved somehow in this murder, um, but because the, the initial processing of the crime scene was handled so badly, it was really difficult to collect good evidence later on. For example, um, after John found his daughter's body and brought it upstairs, uh, the mother uh, you know, bent over the body and, and wept and, and cradled her, her daughter and so forth, and, uh, and they found some fibers from the mother's sweater on the, uh, on the person of the daughter. Well, how did those fibers get there? Did they get there because the mother uh, murdered her daughter, or did they get there because the mother handled her daughter's body after it was found? There's no way of knowing because the evidence was, uh, because the crime scene was not processed in a, in a um, traditional, effective way. So, to review. The crime scene is the area where the crime was committed, plus any entrances, exits, and possible evidence stashes, dumpsters, things like that. The first responder must get backup, help victims, and secure the scene. The crime scene must be recorded before evidence collection occurs. The search is a systematic quest for all physical evidence. The evidence must be handled with new gloves, new disposable forceps for each item. Each item of evidence should be packaged separately in containers specific to its type. Biological evidence must be treated differently from arson-related evidence. Each item of evidence should be, after being packaged, labeled, and sealed with tamper-evident materials. Finally, we must keep in mind that failure or mishandling of evidence recovery may have dire consequences up to and including letting murderers go free such that they kill again or the state uh, killing innocent people. That's the crime scene investigation. That's crime scene processing and evidence collection. I hope this video was helpful. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.